Hey guys, it's Tanika Pantua, and today I'd like to talk about more common mistakes that beginning storyboard artists make. Now, a while ago, I already did a video talking about common mistakes that beginning storyboard artists make, and this is more about the fundamentals of storyboarding, such as jump cuts without purpose, or breaking the staging line, or breaking the 180 degree rule. And most of that is just storyboarding basics, but I think for this one, I wanna talk about common mistakes that actually build up problematic habits, things that are detrimental to the production overall, and recipes for a faster burnout. And to slowly talk about what people don't realize what the job actually entails. The first one I want to talk about is the temptation to over animate your storyboards as a first pass or a rough pass. This means overposing, adding a lot of drawings, adding in betweens. And this is something that has been a topic of hot discussion, especially in the online world of what is considered a good storyboard, what is considered a bad storyboard, what is the standard of a storyboard artist's job and what goes into the territory of job creeping. So when it comes to the end result, I don't really have much of an opinion about overly animated boards. You know, I talked about this in a previous video about how it can lead to things like job creeping or create an unhealthy work dynamic in the workspace, how it can also lead to production problems within the production, since you're giving yourself and others more unnecessary work. Otherwise, if the sequence is really good, it kicks ass, and the artist enjoys the work, then, you know, I'm all in for it, then why not? So like I said earlier, you have to also understand that storyboarding is an incredibly fluid and explorative stage when it comes to an animation production. Things are often redone, revisited, rewritten. Things are constantly changing. Someone getting into storyboarding or a beginning story artist will see a highly animated kick-ass storyboard sequence and say, oh my god, this is what I need to do to do good storyboarding work and commit to an overly animated storyboard, but not having a solid storyboarding foundation. I remember when I was a newer story artist, I over animated my boards because I wanted to show my supervisors and directors that at the time that I was not just your standard storyboard artist, I wanted to be one of the best or incomparable, but at times I forgot the overall job of what a storyboard artist should be doing. Like the drawings were nice, everything was fully posed out, there were some really ambitious animation related stuff, but in terms of storytelling and the point of the sequence, it wasn't there. Like, the storytelling wasn't there. The sequence had no purpose. I remember when I was on Dragon's 3, another board artist who was an amazing animator told me to hold back because I was just giving way more work for the other departments such as other story artists, the editors, more panels that they did not ask for. Like in that case, a version of the movie was already edited and I was just replacing panels here and there within the movie and if I was just adding more, it kind of disrupted their workflow. If you're a new or an experienced board artist, you know, there's two scenarios that can come out of this. Number one, you're most likely not gonna finish. Number two, you might be able to finish it, but you're gonna turn out a sequence that is poorly told or, or poorly storyboarded. Many, including myself, turned out half-finished sequences where there was no real foundation or plans for the full sequence of the storyboard. But even if you do finish and turn out a fully finished or fully animated storyboard, there will be changes to the story script, so you may have to redo a lot of work or redo the whole thing, and then you have to repeat the process again and again. It's a recipe for a faster burnout. So my whole solution and advice for this is to thumbnail your whole sequence in small little squares and figure out your shots and overall sequence. You know, just make sure you have a clear beginning, middle, and end for the overall sequence. Again, this stuff will also prevent you from drawing highly detailed as well as worry more about the staging and the blocking of your sequence. It will also prevent you from overly animating your boards since you're way more economic in your drawings. And then once you have that overall thumbnail passed down, at least you have a foundation at least you have your plan set. So, you know, if you aren't able to fulfill all the ambitions you have for the sequence, at least you have something to show. At least you can share your ideas. But I think it's also important to have something like this because even if you do decide to overly animate or overly polish your boards, you can scale these thumbnails up, have them as your layout, have them as your placeholder and work with that. Because to me, the thumbnail pass is a very creative stage where things are still in the very explorative and loose stage, but once the sequence feels more tightened or once you know you get approval of moving forward or you have the foundation figured out, the over animating stuff is just labor work at that point. And you don't have to juggle between the creative problem solving and the labor work. 
Another rule that I give to myself is that I limit the number of panels there are per shot. So if I'm thumbnailing or if I'm storyboarding a very first pass, I usually just stick to one or a few drawings per shot. The next one I want to talk about is starting with overly polished boards. I think this is a very similar issue to overly animating and overposing your boards. It's things like having super detailed or super clean drawings, having light and shadow effects, some tone here and there, blur effects, atmospheric effects, things like dust, fog, moving in the background. Again, each board looks like a fully finished illustration. Now, having tones, shadows, and lighting effects are great because it can give atmosphere and make your board panels feel a bit more complete than a very sketchy one. But like over animating your boards, you can spend way more time on the labor's process, more so than the creative process that needs to be fleshed out. Because if you think about it, you do a loose drawing that kind of describes everything that you need to know about that shot or panel. You can just pretty much wrap up that panel and move on. But with super clean lines, shadow and shading, that's more work that you have to think about just to wrap up a panel. And if you're passing off work to fellow revisionists or fellow storyboard artists who have to revise your work, they might have to spend more time just trying to match the consistency of the standard that you initially set up. A similar issue to board artists that over animate their work and to pass off that work to other revisionists and story artists. Now the examples I'm showing you are based on productions that I've been involved with. Now the reason why they're fully toned out and maybe posed out is because they were already approved when I showed them the thumbnail pass or a very rough pass. I don't do the stuff until the end. Usually in feature, if we have time, we'll start to clean up the drawings. We'll start to make the drawings look more appealing for a screening for the executives, for the studio, etc. So I think I have a few advice and solutions to this because there's a lot that can go with this. First of all, I want to have a decent shorthand. So something that is loose and quick, not worrying too much about the details, but overall clarity within the attitude and the acting and the silhouette. So when I animate, I draw a sphere for the head and then continue adding more shapes to complete a head. But with a shorthand, I just have one single shape that represents a head. Sometimes I add hair, sometimes I make it stay on model, but in most cases, a shorthand is very loose. So if your storyboards have designs that you can work off of, sketch over those character designs and try and find really simple shapes. Something that's clear enough, something that represents the character, something that doesn't have too many drawings of construction lines here and there. And of course, if you have time to polish your boards, you can go back and finesse the drawings on top of your much looser drawings. And I usually do this when my shorthands aren't clear enough. I've gotten to a point where my shorthands can be used for my final storyboards. And of course that comes with experience. I've been working as a story artist for a while, so drawing shorthands is super fast for me. But let's say your shorthand is very loose and very scribbly, but it's still clear. You can just add a solid matte below that layer, maybe give it a different tone, maybe add a few blotches of shadows and shading, and it makes the storyboard look a bit more finished. And sure, maybe I could add more effects, more lighting, maybe clean up the drawings, but look how simple my layering is when I look at these storyboards. When I look at potential storyboard artists, when I look at their portfolio, I register to things closer when the drawings are more loose or more sketchy, just because it gives me an idea that they can work within a schedule, that I can tell that they're working within a time frame. But some of you guys might go, wait a second, what about your blue-eyed samurai boards? Because those are heavily lit and you know, there's a lot of like gradients and lighting effects and things like that. But like I showed in another video, it's actually relatively simple in how each of those panels are made. Those drawings are still very sketchy and very loose with me only adding detail in things like faces or things that are important. You know, having a big brush helps because it gives an impression of shapes and shadows, but I really just give it a solid matte below it, like a gray, just to make it feel more solid. But if I strip away, you know, the gradients, the shadow, the lighting effects and things like that, it's still clear. I save things like polishing my storyboards at the end stage. So things like lighting, shadows, and also overposing my boards if I need to. Also with Blue Eye specifically, I made custom actions that allowed me to automate the process of toning and shadows super fast. Now the next one I want to talk about is forgetting to utilize proportion and perspective. When I look at potential board artists, sometimes they're lacking skills in defining depth or staging. They don't know how to keep their characters grounded. It feels like characters are floating all over the place. It doesn't feel like they're standing or they're grounded onto something. And characters change scale and size to each other or that the character's arm will get bigger, or their head will get bigger, or the style changes because the proportion is entirely different. In feature animation, proportion and perspective aren't necessarily priorities. In TV animation, it's mandatory due to a punchy schedule of a TV production, as well as working with a vendor studio. Especially in a 2D animated show, since some studios use storyboards as their layout. 
that animators can animate on top of. Now, I've been on different TV productions, Puss in Boots TV, Blue Eye Samurai, Invincible, Kipo. There's a whole discussion about how on-model storyboard artists should be for a production or how solid or how detailed their drawing should look. Now, from my experience, proportion and perspective are number one priority when it comes to drawing. This means that character proportions and scales are proportionate, they're proportionate to each other, and grounding them to a background, and using perspective along with that. I feel like when it comes to animation, perspective is pretty much the universal language of drawing, especially for animation. And when I say universal, I mean universal. It's not just storyboard artists that use it, it's character design, it's backgrounds, it's animation. It's also universal based on territory too. In Western production, anime, movies, video games, etc. Having perspective skills helps keep a lot of your characters grounded and the proportions consistent throughout the whole setting. Knowing perspective is basically visual math. It allows you to solve problems where you're trying to figure out a scale of a character in one perspective or one part of the background and then trying to match it when you want to put that character in another part of the background. In most cases, story artists that don't really use perspective will, you know, resort to having a character shrink or enlarge whenever they need to, instead of how they should change size based on proportion and perspective. Knowing where you put your horizon line allows you to kind of determine if the camera is a high angle or a low angle, and trying to figure out depth in your staging. Something I'm noticing with newer story artists, and I'm going to put myself in this because I make the same mistake too, is the heavy reliance on 3D sets and backgrounds. In most TV action shows, we get a 3D model of the set, and the 3D model has placeholders of the characters within the shot. But what if you had to work on the same scene and you don't have access to those 3D models, then you have to utilize perspective. When it comes to like the thumbnailing or the exploration or the experimental part of storyboarding, I don't think trying to figure out the proportions and perspective is a very crucial state at this point, but I do believe that having a bit of hints about that is good to have in your thumbnails. So when I do thumbnails, I usually like to have a horizon line and some vanishing points, and I'll roughly put in a grid line on the floors and sky to determine depth and an angle. So let's say you're done thumbnailing and you move on to actual storyboarding. When you're boarding, you know, determine your horizon line first and then start figuring out the vanishing point. If your shot has characters changing position and staging, you know, figure that out on a separate layer in a drawing and just try to figure that out with perspective drawing skills. Sometimes I just do a layer where I just draw out very rough notes or very rough scribbles about character proportions based on where they're at. These are drawings that won't be used in the final storyboard, but it's there for me to figure out the staging and stuff like that when I'm actually boarding. Now the next one I want to talk about is not having a smooth flow when you're pitching your storyboards. Now the final animatics you see online from a production don't necessarily reflect what the actual job of storyboarding is like. There's the pitching process. You know, it's when you verbally pitch your sequence shot by shot, even before the sequence is edited into an animatic. You're vocally pitching it as if it was playing. Usually a beginning story artist will spend too much time verbally describing what is happening in the shot, what kind of shot it is, what angle the shot is, or describing every piece of detail in a single panel or shot. A good pitch will represent the flow of how it should play out. Instead of describing the shot, just describe the character's action while flipping through your boards. No need to describe the shot composition, the angle, what the character is wearing, or all these little nit bits. And even if your initial drawings are super rough, sometimes even unclear, you're meant to capture the overall feeling of the sequence more so than describing every visual detail. The audience or the person you are pitching to isn't as dumb as you think. A good storyboard pitch is, let's say you pitch your sequence verbally and clear, even if the thumbnails or drawings aren't the best, it can determine whether the sequence captures the heart and soul of that sequence. You know, drawings speak volumes for sure, but when you pitch it, that's when you can actually capture the feeling of what that sequence is all about. Pitching is an art form. Sometimes you have to loosen yourself up just to get good at it. It's just one of those things you just have to keep practicing. When you're practicing pitching your scene, think about how it'll play in real time. If you see yourself stalling or pausing, just keep going and improvise. You don't have to be super involved or be super extroverted when you pitch, it can just be a really casual pitch. I remember when I was a trainee at DreamWorks, we did improv classes and that was just to encourage, you know, just being loose, uh, to be adaptable and just to roll with things rather than stopping and stuttering with mistakes. 
Another few tips I can give about pitching verbally is understand your sequence, like understand what the overall point of that sequence is, what you're trying to emphasize, and I think that'll give you a clear direction of what to prioritize in your sequence. Like when I think about the priorities of my sequence, I think about whose point of view it is, what they're trying to accomplish, what I'm trying to accomplish with the sequence, what's the overall tone, mood, and vibe about the sequence, and really hone in on that. So yeah, those are some common mistakes that I see from beginning board artists. The reason why I wanted to talk about these ones, especially when it came to over animating your boards or over polishing your boards, for example, is because they don't really reflect the truth about what the actual job entails. And it's easy to get carried away with just polishing your boards. Like I said with perspective and proportion, that's mostly a TV thing. In feature, it's not really prioritized based on my experience, but I think it's crucial to know it. And if you have some indication that you have an understanding of perspective, consistency, proportion, and depth is going to make your portfolio stand out better. Like if they see that you understand this stuff, it makes you much more hireable. It's going to make the background artists, the layout artists, and the animators jobs much easier. And if you're doing independent animation, it helps. Pitching is one of those things that you get used to over time. Like nowadays, I don't overact or I don't really put a character out when I pitch. I just pitch like this, like I'm normally talking and that's fine. Sometimes I'll be a lot more casual or, you know, swear or things like that. But in most cases, it's really casual. But anyways, that's all I want to talk about. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye. Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. Learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos. Visit the store through the link in the description below.